having these uh, to have about, well, oh, thank you, Marty. Um, we designed these to have about a half an hour Q&A session, um, but we, again, do play it pretty fast and loose. So if the presentation goes long and there's not enough time to have all these questions answered, please do provide those questions in the chat. Emily will curate those and she will uh, get back together with Mercy to make sure those questions get answered. And then we'll send those answers, uh, the Q&A um, narrative out to the group along with a link uh, to the recording, which will be posted up on, on YouTube. Um, Marty, you're, you're very good at reminding me if I've forgotten anything. Before I introduce Mercy, is there anything more that, uh, that we need to tell our attendees today? Um, I think the only thing I'd like to mention is that we have our next Lunch and Learn planned already, and it's going to be August 17th with Adi Kandib from the American Farmland Trust. So mark your calendars, and we'll remind you again at the end, and we'll send out stuff about that. But just wanted to say that up front. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Marty. Uh, well, please join me then in, in welcoming Mercy Karaoke McGee, um, who... Uh, is the director of the Hockey Farmers Collective. Um, she also convened the informal BIPOC leadership team, um, which went forward with uh, a report, uh, developing a report um, on equity within the food systems here in West Western Washington. So um, very much looking forward uh, to hearing what Mercy has to say and, and uh, get a little bit uh, more information on that report from her perspective. Um, Mercy, please take it away. And you are muted. Let's unmute first. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is again, is Mercy Karyuki McGee. I am the co-founder and the director of Haki Farmers Collective. Um, I'm honored to be here today. Um, and I believe we are on a lunch right now so we should just dive in into the presentation so those who have to go back to work can actually have lunch with us and proceed back to doing what they love to do uh, so i'm gonna run my uh powerpoint today i'm gonna be using a powerpoint to go through what we are talking about here today um like uh, mike, mike said uh i'll be happy to answer questions now or later so I'm going to share my screen, pardon, bear with me while I do that. One second, while I get myself ready here. Okay, always takes a minute to navigate um, the software. Um, okay, here we go. And I don't know if everyone noticed Milo just uh, shared the report in the chat. So if you're curious about it, it's there. Thank you for doing that, Milo. Thank you so much. Um, let's reorganize my screen here and I'll be ready to play this PowerPoint for you. Um, I want this thing to disappear. Pardon with me. I, I don't know how to get these things out of my way. What I get this running here. I'll stop that for a second. All right, thank you so much. I would like to take a minute. Um, I would like you to read the information on my screen. We like to acknowledge the living um, acknowledgement of black labor that was the backbone of uh, agriculture in, in America. So we'd like to take a minute and honor the ancestors who enabled us to continue looking at what agriculture should be like and how to create a better food system. And um, this is where our knowledge is coming from. So take a minute and read my screen. We'll take a minute on that. Thank you. 
thank you for acknowledging that. Um, again, uh, my name is Mose Karyuki Magi, co-founder of Haki Farmers Collective. And today I am here to present to you um, our findings on the equity report that was produced uh, back in uh, November of 2021. Um, a little bit about who we are. Haki means justice in Swahili. And Haki Farmers Collective seeks to bolster and incorporate traditional and inheritance sustainable farming knowledge that is present in our migrant and indigenous communities that live in within us. We are 501c3 organization based in the South Sound. Our goal is to enhance food sovereignty for our communities of color, create spaces in which we can produce food together increase the understanding of BIPOC needs in our state, preserve knowledge of traditional farming so we can pass it to the next generation, engage our communities of color, increase land ownership for the BIPOC, and steward the land with intention and mutual respect. So Mike invited me here today to talk about this report, assessing what food system through an equity lens bridging the gap through cultural elephant foods. This was conducted by an informal bike park leadership team that was assembled in August 21 in collaboration with Wasu Food System. This report was um, requested by Department of, Ag Department of Agriculture when they were preparing to disperse some money for, from the American Rescue Fund to, co to help BIPOC and underserved community to cope with the impacts of COVID-19. This study was both done by Wasu Food System and UDAB as well. And you can find both the reports on our website, uh, uh, UDAB and WASDA website as well. So in 2021, I gathered local BIPOC food growers, distributors, hunger relief entities, and students from various campuses to come support Wasu Food System to examine ways in which COVID-19 impacted our local system and especially access for black and brown consumers, as well as the other side. The combination of these was a series of in-depth surveys which reviewed crucial gaps in our current abilities to reach those most in need of food security. I often ask why equity in food system? Because most people miss the point of what equity means. To me, it's a human right. To me and my family and my community, we believe that every child, every human deserves to eat. Mm. To us as communities of color and everyone who is interested in equity, do know that it's not a luxury for most people. We also do know that just hiding food to a poor person doesn't solve the actual problems. We also know that we as humans stand in the way of creating a better food system by refusing to accept this fact. We also know that lack of food leads to poor health, healthy, uh, healthy individuals, and everyone knows that this is the case because data has been there to prove that fact. We also have heard many times from our friends, our families, that a hungry child cannot learn on an empty stomach. This was something that was repeatedly told to me when I was growing up as a young girl in rural Kenya, where we grew our own food, but still we saw people suffering from uh, food access. So I wanna dive in into the equity report and I wanna start with the executive summary. A little bit of the background again, WASDA contracted WASU to do a need assessment to inform and understand the food insecurity and food system disruptions in BIPOC communities and socially disadvantaged groups in, in Washington state, specifically in Washington state. So we use a couple of words. We reviewed the existing data, collected case studies, and hosted conversations and interviews among the BIPOC community and other entities were engaged in, in our food system, either aggregators, growers, or even um, social justice um, entities. We conducted a SWOT analysis. 
For those who don't know what a SWOT analysis is, it looks at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of a particular issue. So we, we did a SWOT analysis on our food system. And what I'm gonna be looking at is what that looked like today. Some of the takeaways from this study uh, that we found um, after a very intense moment of about two months to do this, inequities were exacerbated by, by COVID. We found that we must center racial equity in this work, meaning the food system. We must build a new collaborative infrastructure that takes all those who are impacted into account. Funding is needed to create robust and sustainable solutions, which was a key thing working in our finding. We also found out that supply chains were really stressed out and were evolving and are still evolving past COVID. So addressing hunger as a racial equity issue, a couple of things that we have to think about. Food insecurity and hunger are related to health crisis, climate change, racism, social injustice, and civil unrest in most cases. By now, we know that COVID-19 impacted higher, was higher among the communities of color. We, by now, we also know that data gaps did fail to fully describe the unique impacts of COVID on communities of color and socially disadvantaged communities because of entries that showed unknown for us, vaccination site accessibility issues. There was a lot of trust issues during COVID among communities of color and other religious groups. We also have seen studies that came out. This one is in particular one that I like a lot because it shows you the life expectancy of BIPOC communities during COVID. This was looking coming towards from 2020 and coming towards 2020. You can see how the curve goes up and then during COVID, it really dropped. So you can see the black communities at 325. That's pretty high. We have seen this even before COVID because of health, health issues, but COVID even made it harder because of there is some of the reasons that we looked at. So some of the most common indicators of food access disparities, economic stability, education, transportation, health and healthcare, race, ethnicity, language barriers, neighborhood and built environments, social and community context and racial inequities. Some of these are, we already know about, some we ignore, like neighborhood and built environment. What has that to do with access to food, uh, transportation? What that has to do with um, accessing food? Sometimes we find food banks are not anywhere near you. Sometimes, you don't have ways to get there. Sometimes you have medical issues that don't allow you to get there. Sometimes you don't have access to the website to order your food online or find where to go. So many things that come around that create food access disparities. So what we found out is that COVID created worsening inequities. However, people build resiliency despite all these constraints. And we're gonna look at those, some of those. So on our SWOT analysis, again, the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that were presented by COVID. One of the things that we looked at is the inequities and innovations. What COVID did is pushed black and brown people and socially disadvantaged communities to the, to, the, to the edge. We also saw that communities and grassroots efforts did increase 
There are people delivering water. There are people taking on themselves to do these things. There are people like ourselves increase our food production. We, we try to work with the other community grassroots mutual aid organization to find out how to cook food. We were cooking food and taking it out to the streets. New solutions were created with very little funding. And again, those mutual aid uh, organizations were raising funds, very little funds and putting their heads together to figure out how to get food to the people, to get water or to even get medical supplies. So we saw a lot of these when we did the SWOT analysis. And here is some of the data that we, we did. And again, I want to tell you that some of this data that we were looking at came from Yoda, who have been doing most of these studies on food access um, in Washington state. At least one out of 10 household reported food insecurity. And one out of, one out of three household reported food insecurity and even higher between, within the BIPOC household. One in two was suffering from hunger during COVID. And again, you can access these um, reports and this data through the UW um, website that is listed on, the, listed on this um, PowerPoint. And I'll share that with you. So some of the strengths that we saw is new collaborations. The weaknesses were, was the fragility of the system. And the opportunity is the new funding for sustainable partnership. We found people trying to find ways to find um, food access, ways to donate more money. We saw organizations going back and rethinking how they do their funding. Uh, how can we put more money within the grassroots movements? The threat, the threat was investment community organizations wasn't there. Again, the numbers were still looking high during COVID, nothing was changing for black and brown people regardless of these innovative ways that we saw. This, docu this data set here is from UDAB. This is some of the studies that they conducted. And the green shows you before COVID, the yellow shows you after COVID, during COVID. You can see uh, the indication and, and we're gonna run into the race and ethnicity, which is a focus of this, um, this report today. Um, on the Hispanic, 42 pre-COVID, during COVID, 54%. Um, NH Black, 49, jump to 52%. Um, AIN and AIN and NHOPI, that's the, um, the non-Black, non-Latinx, 50%. You can see how this was jumping on each race and ethnicity group, there was a huge jump on, 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 on uh, food access during COVID and the impacts of lack of food. Um, so one of the things that we saw was that communities of color continuously lack food because of all the inequities that we talked about, the disparities, the, the, the barriers that we looked at. Um, we also saw that there was a huge increase on community usage, usage of grocery vouchers, uh, mobile boxes. Um, and this is part of the, 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 um, the, the SNAP program increased during COVID as well. But one of the other things that we ran out of this is that we could use better data collection, you know, that indicate actual new data on the ground. This, was, this data was good, but it wasn't telling us the actual data because this was based out of a sample not speaking to the new people suffering from hunger. And we also looked at the producer side of things. We saw that producers pivoted. The strengths of that was expansion of the networks and collaboration efforts again. Uh, labor, made many of the larger farms reduced their work with hours or staff because either they were calling in sick or they couldn't even afford to continue um, farming because labor was very expensive during COVID. Um, we also saw that there was new, new finding. There was a new opportunity again on producer side. Um, you know, the government put money towards uh, farmers as well. Um, we, the threat for the producers was climate change. You all remember the heat wave that really affected a lot of the farmers in Washington state. 
and especially farmers who didn't have the infrastructure or the, uh, the capacity to deal with the changing climate, meaning they didn't have a way to cool their, their greenhouses, they didn't have ways to grow food indoors. Um, most of the farmers who are small scale don't have those things. So far, farming was left hanging for small scale farmers and we had to rely on food coming out of the state or grown indoors by other larger farming entities. Just in 2021, as power data sets, 42% of our farm COVID farms employee reduced during COVID-19, 42%. 65% of the wild farm respondents increased their prices due to COVID. That means food was more expensive uh, because long hours at the farm, um, you have to pay over time. Um, food had to go very far once you, 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 you grow it and harvest it. So all those this contributed to the increase of the 65% that you're seeing here during COVID. We looked at the supply chain. You all remember the craziness of running to Target and there was nothing. So we were very interested in understanding how the supply chains were working. And the strengths, rapid coordinated emergency response. Again, this was coming from grassroots uh, organizations, mutual aid, uh, people used their personal cars, people set up a small neighborhood um, give away spots so people can get food. We saw a lot of people trying to reach out to each other and creating better emergency response to COVID. Um, we saw people offering to deliver um, medication door to door to the seniors and disabled. Um, we saw people offering their spaces to help those who are having, especially during the, the heat wave, providing a space for cooling. So we saw all these things happening during COVID and trying to bring food to these spaces that really needed the food. Um, the weaknesses was the logistics. Most people don't have the capacity to do these big logistic, um, you know, transportation logistics. Um, so we, that really affected the way food was moving. And people weren't prepared to be able to move food that quick with very little labor. So the logistics became really affected uh, by COVID. The opportunities, again, we saw funding to support suppliers and suppliers changed the diversification, meaning they tried to go out of their, their common ways of doing things so they can get the merchandise um, and the dry food and the medical supplies to where they needed to be on time. So there was a lot of that happening during COVID-19. The threat, again, existing racial disparities were reinforced. Food in the lower income did not get there. Uh, we saw huge lines of people trying to get food because again, resources don't, are not equally distributed within our food system. So the lower, the people in the, in, the, in the ethnicity groups always are the last to get the food in their spaces. Um, they don't have um, the ability to buy food in large quantities. Um, most of them can order food online. They have to queue up and carry little bags. So there were so many things that really were reinforced um, by the way food was being delivered to the people. Uh, even if entities like the food bank was allowing people to order food online, not everybody has access to get there. Those who could order food online were able to, but not everyone has that access. So we saw that happening a lot based on some of the people we spoke on the ground. Um, so again, the study from Wild Food showed 39 increase in food bank de deliveries for food insecure. Um, and 76 experienced at least moderate drought during COVID-19. And in three months, 43% of food processors reported closure time, um, you know, some meat processing, the, especially like in the, in the, in the um, native uh, meat processors, they were really hit hard uh, in their meat processing um, and their dairy farms. So we saw all these things were made even worse, even if they already exist, 
COVID really made it hard for them to continue operating. This is one, one thing we wanted to do with this study is actually bring real content and, and really talk to real people on the ground. The quote in front of you, that's one of our surveys. We conducted surveys in a very quick way. And this is what some of the BIPOC um, participants told us that they need more vehicles, larger cold storage spaces, cyclonized logistics, production for small and medium skilled food businesses, cultural elephant shelf stable food. That was really common throughout the study and the survey is that the food that is being given to black and brown people is not necessarily what they would eat. So that food recycles back into the food bank. Uh, so we create waste constantly because we are giving people food that doesn't really matter to them. Oh, they don't know how to cook it. If you give me tuna, I don't know what to do with tuna. I didn't grow up in a, with a, a can of tuna, so it just goes to waste. Um, so we had people saying that they were give, being given food they don't know how to cook, or if you give somebody a mac and cheese and they don't have a way of cooking mac and cheese, then that just becomes a waste. So we wanted to be able to hear what people were experiencing and especially those people who are engaged in distributing food and, and medical supplies during COVID-19. And throughout our study in the report, you will see these quotes uh, quoted within the report. So one other thing we wanted to look at is how can the government and those in position of funding invest in equity? How was that done during COVID? Some of the strengths that we, do, we saw was commitment to racial equity in data and implementation is essential. Um, there was missing data um, in some of the studies. Um, the opportunities was more paid support for BIPOC came up as something that can happen. Um, allowing BIPOC to be in leadership teams, um, the threats, Quality data is difficult to access, to assess equity without quality data, without understanding who is who in the community who identifies as a BIPOC, who is who in the community who needs help, who is who in the community who is doing this work, to be able to collaborate with them to correct quality data. And what we saw on the data looking at USDA data, 4% of farmers across Washington state identify as a BIPOC. That's a very low number. Um, Ferry, King, Whatcom counties had the highest proportion of BIPOC farmers, 10%, 8%, 7% respectively. But you can still see these numbers are really low. Uh, we feel like there might be other BIPOC farmers who don't identify them as farmers because of either the size of the land that they are farming, either because they are urban farmers or they count themselves as farmers. So when the census ask, are you a farmer? You say, no, I'm not. So that quality data is lacking because of the methodologies that are applied to collect this data in the first place. Um, so investing in equity, this is one of the biggest key takeaway out of this equity report. We must center issue equity in, in our food system and invest in creating spaces and building new collaborative infrastructure. Those collaborative infrastructure is what is gonna lead us to be able to tackle equity, meaning find people who are working in equity with their own people and find out how you can partner with them because then you can actually reach into the deep pockets of the people who identify themselves as black and brown. Here's one of the quotes from one of our participants. Too many agencies are doing performative performative equity instead of the real work. We must break the cycle of simply calling on black and brown leaders when you need our data and networks. That's from the survey. We did not ask for the names and as they identified. So this was somebody we sent the survey and this is what they had to say. If you talk to the people, black and brown people, this is what they would say. We have to have these people in the spaces to build equity together. You can build equity for us, just like I can come to your house and run your house for you. Simple as that. 
So we made some recommendations and next steps to ASDA, and I'm gonna be running those for you. Um, Emily, how are we doing for time? I was just gonna let you know we're at 12:35. Um, so okay. maybe we, we did start a little late. So maybe you know try to wrap it up in the next five, five minutes. minutes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Can wrap it up really quick. Yeah, thank you. So recommendation and next steps. This is what we sent to ASDA with this report. Approach food access programs using an equity-based model. Use a bottom-up approach to increase BIPOC participation outreach within BIPOC communities. Increase support for BIPOC-led teams, farmers, producers, distributors, food justice advocates into the system. Increase BIPOC participation in the food system program design, implementation, evaluation, policy, directed interventions cannot be done with BIPOC uh, not on the table. Data correction and aggregation show gaps that affect systematic and structural racism. So partnering with BIPOC community leaders and ensuring real-time demographic in data can really help close out that gap. Increasing BIPOC leadership in hunger relief programs and other government contracting is another way to increase equity. Prioritizing culturally relevant solutions for hunger relief that are focused on individual communities and led by BIPOC organization is another way to gap to create, um, to bridge the equity disparities. Bottom line, we must center and support authentic and equitable, equitable BIPOC leadership. This is for the BIPOC team here to say, we must center ratio equity and food security work, invest in creating spaces and building those collaborative infrastructure. This is something we agreed upon, which is something that we wanna move forward towards as we continue to work on our food system. So looking across data on food insecurity, producers inside, distributors, and other key stakeholders, we noticed many common themes. Analysis was complex, but we found the overall BIPOC farmers and producers need more support, particularly logistical and financial support. So then we can create a sustainable system. So looking ahead, continue working, finding ways to create an equitable food system, increase BIPOC producer farmers participation in the BIPOC food system, look at factors that contribute to the inequities, get to the roots, use real data to inform policy changes, design and implementation, shift the paradigm, connect the dots if you want to create equity in our food system, use an equity lens that help build a more resilient and a sustainable food system that works for all. Equity today is how I wanna look at it. It has become a complete myth for us. When we black and brown people uh, uh, look at equity, we are like, it's a myth because we are constantly being removed out of the system. And for us, we are destroying, when you try to do equity, if you don't understand what it is, we are destroying the progress before it's even made. When you give us a TISA and then you take it away, you're destroying our ability to help in equity. The main points and takeaways for us, and this is based on my recent um, uh, encounter with WASDA. WASDA approaches equity with such a low points of cultural relevancy. We fail to address to, to address anything else in, in their in our evaluation concerns and look at race. And, and, in, and instead of looking at race and imbalance in our food system, we give it a point value instead of looking at who we are talking to. We incentivizing we incentivize the equity and prioritize large sized wildlife organization who has capacity instead of looking at who equity belongs to. Government is only concerned with cost and capacity of the large white red organization to sustain the current system. Again, instead of looking at the longer term equity impacts. Absolutely, there is never a consideration of ability of BIPOC providers to connect with other sub communities when it comes to providing these things. And again, large way led do not have the capacity to do equity unless we are there with, with them to help guide the process. Money allocation is in, to train them on equity or other outdated protocols for diversity inclusion and diversity training is what we've been seeing happening all along. The system does not believe that people of color can provide their for their own. So we end up being told we have to go to the white led organizations so we can provide equity. And we find that in most of the time, public money is being misused as a way to check a box 
because we are still having people going hungry. We are still having people who don't have land. We are still having people asking, where can I buy land? How can I buy land? We still have organizations that are small scale without resources to operate. So this is how we have to look at equity. Don't check a box. Look at the real, the real ways to really impact uh, equity and create a better food system. You can read the full report and share with your partners. It's up on our website. You can find it at Wasu uh, Food System website as well. Um, I do work with Wasu Food System on equity, and we do have another large project that's coming out soon. We're gonna be resuming after the season on understanding uh, staple crop and what that means to the communities of color. And there's a way to connect with us, but I wanna leave you with some very popular quotes that I like. These are two of my heroes. Raj Patel said, food sovereignty is mostly characterized by its conversations allowed how to end hunger and poverty. And Wangari Madai said, for her, one of the major reasons to move beyond just planting trees was that I have tendency to look at, if I can move this thing out of the way, I can see what's below there, because it's hiding it. Um, as the basis of problem, we often preoccupy ourselves with the symptoms, Whereas if we went to the root cause of the problems, we would be able to overcome problems once and for all. And for Haki, that's what we do. We go to the roots, we look at what's lacking in our system, and we try to ask those in charge to help us fix it. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. And I'm open for questions now. Thank you, Mercy. Um, I'll let um, uh, Marty and, and Emily lead the Q and A. Um, we have uh, we have uh, about twenty minutes left, and and Mercy, thank you again. I know there's so much information, and um, what a, a wonderful job of of fitting it into such a small space. Thank you again. Thank you. So I've been. Uh collecting the questions in the chat. And I will start with David Belinda asked, how accurate is the WSU or UW data and how old is the data? And he said he's asking as an immigrant. Thank you, David. The data I believe is accurate because UW has, become, has been conducting war food data surveys. I think they are on war food 10. Right now, um, let me see whether I can pull that. That data should be accurate uh, because this is data that they have shared with the legislature, with the state um, uh, policymakers. So I believe that data is correct. Uh, that's not our data. That's data that came from other sources. And again, we did not collect data for this project. We did a SWOT analysis and used existing data and existing literatures that are some of them are peer reviewed um, to make sure that we do understand what the system has been doing and what the system did during COVID and where the system is headed and what recommendations can be drawn from those data surveys. Great. Uh, moving on, the next question in the chat was from Marcy Cleaver, and it was, how many farms were surveyed and responded to to give your data? And she also wanted to know um, the types of farms surveyed, like by size, um, prior year sales amounts, and the locations of the farm, um, just in terms of like the breakdown between Western Washington and Eastern Washington farms, if you have that. Again. Again, we have to go back and look at the wild farm surveys. Um, I don't have that data with me. We can write that down and we can get back to her with that. That, that information came from wild food and wild farm. Um, so we can look at the, they have that data on their website so we can put that information and share with them. I don't have that at the back of my head. All I know is those numbers were pretty accurate. Perfect, great, thank you, Mercy. Um, and then the next question was from Dante at Millennium Ministries, and he was wondering if you knew what counties are experiencing high amounts of food insecurity. Um, yes, all the all the counties that are within a food desert are experiencing a high amount of. Uh, um, and I don't have the map in front of me, but most of the counties that were within the food desert 
um, which is, I believe, um, I think, uh, it's not what, um, I think, uh, uh, what is it called? The Kitsap area is one of them. Uh, Daston County, Lewis County, Mason County, those really had high numbers of food disparities, as well as the high population areas with a with a heavy with a heavy um, heavy numbers of immigrants, like in the King County area as well. And I will say that Mercy, you uh, showed me the health disparities map on the Washington DOH site. And that mm -hmm. was a really great resource. I believe you can filter for food food inequity, like food access. So I, that's a really great resource. I'll try and find a link and put it in the chat. And if not, I'll make sure it's linked in the Q&A sheet we send out after. Yes, that, that's, yeah, the Department of Health has that uh, data as well. Um, and we can plug in that. Um, Are you talking about the, let's see which one is It looks one? like Milo actually just linked to it. I think oh, they're from, okay. Okay. They're from um, DOH, so okay. perfect. Oh, Thank they're you from so DOH, much. oh perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and then the last question I had in the chat before we open it up to others was from Diane Smith. And that question was, Excuse me. I wonder if there are successful models for the two concerned uh, concerns that were mentioned. So one, supporting families and learning how to prepare unfamiliar food um, and finding funding for in infrastructure like refrigerator trucks, units, vehicles. So I don't know um, if you have that off the top of your in the back of your brain anywhere, but if not, we'll make sure to just mark that down and look into it and see if we can find any to share. Um, the, the, I don't have any at the back of my, my, um, my head, but I know that there are some models where like um, more, um, more biomarkets where refrigerated vehicles go into the site. And one of the models that we've used is during um, our hunger relief project that just ended today, we actually took the food to the communities that needed. One of the best models that we came up with is finding who is who in the community, who is working with the other served and black and brown people, and we partner with them to take the food directly to the community instead of um, using the existing models of um, uh, we will be so-and-so giving away food or we will we'll deliver food to the food bank. The best model is where you utilize the local grassroots uh, movement to actually deliver the food. And for infrastructure building, that, act, that really falls back into the way the government funding is structured, the way the system qualifies um, those who get funding. They can put billions of dollars out but does their system really look at what the needs are? Are they looking at the deliverables? Are they looking at the, the size of the organization apply? Well, our experience is that if you don't have two, three, five years experience, you automatically don't have the right experience. If you don't have the capacity, meaning labor, you can show that you have 25 people in your staff, to do the work, then you're excluded. But that is not true because Haki for the last six months, we have delivered over 30,000 pounds of food with only one van, two foot, one full time employee because I don't get paid. Uh, we don't have money to do that. That's again, resources, um, volunteers. And we've been able to deliver food to from all the way from Lewis County, Mason County, Thurston County, Pierce County, King County, North and South, using one mid-sized fan. And we've done in one trip, we can carry about 600 pounds of food into this community. So we find a community that's already working on the ground. We partner with them. We meet up, we say, hey, here are your bags. See you next time, or we're gonna be in your community doing a pop-up, bring your people out. And that has been the, that's the best model. That's the best way to feed people who are in need because you're facing people who either don't wanna come out because they are either immigrants and they're scared. Um, 
they face deportation. So you can ask them to identify who you are. So it's really moving away from business as usual and questioning people um, about their, their family sizes. Well, that's critical because we need to know how much food we need to give you. The one that sticks up to me is like your financial need. With our program, we don't ask questions because financial needs are different from each community. People suffer from hunger for different reasons. People get end up on the streets for different reasons. And when you start asking people, they shy away. If you allow them to come out, those who are sincere are not suffering from hunger or are not facing uh, losing their home, they won't come looking for food. If they are trying to cheat, they'll be too shy when they see who else is coming. And that has been a real experience that we've had really experienced in the last six months of being hunger relief. Unfortunately, I have to say in this group, we didn't qualify for the hunger relief for second year. So we, are, we have been left scrambling, trying to raise money to be able to continue serving these communities, especially in the rural, in the rural of Vaston County, Lewis County, uh, Mason County, we have uh, communities of color that really need food. And when, when we show up again, trust, they come out. They wanna work with us. So there's no better model than using the BIPOC themselves and let them talk to their people the way they know how best to. Okay, it looks like David I, Belinda has his hand raised. David, do you have a question? Actually, I want to piggyback. Marcy, thank you very much for bringing out that out that uh, BIPOC have been left out in most of these important decisions, especially in distribution of resources. Uh, every time we apply for funding, I work with Akulema, we are not acknowledged because we are a small organization led by Black people, uh, African who have an accent and heavy tongue. So those are some of the challenges that you're facing. But I also want to piggyback on what exactly you're doing a great job in serving our community. But I also want to say that we have been through this COVID era working a lot. We've been in business for over six years and we, have, we are struggling finding money to run organizations as BIPOC. Because what happens is that when they say BIPOC, they say black. And in the BIPOC, there is the Black and then there's the African people who sometimes we don't feel counted, we feel left out. So organizations that have funny names like mine, when we probably submit a, a grant with their leadership. I know one time we went and we asked who was on your board when we gave our names, the names of the people on the board, this guy just dismissed us because there was no white person on our board. But what you're saying is that there is a lot of racial injustices in our community. We can have all these conversations. And that's why I'm asking this Wazoo uh, research. How old is it? Who was, because I, I work with a lot of people. We do a lot of farming. We were struggling sell, getting our food to be sold uh, during the COVID period because nobody who had the money wanted to buy our food. So we're saying that we need proper representation as communities of color. We need to be identified as African immigrants who are who have a different value of the land, the soil. Uh, Masi will tell you how, for example, where we come from, I come from Kenya, we value the land and we work hard. And that's why she can say she's distributing food with no pay because it's out of passion. And actually nobody can afford to pay us because the work that we do, we do out of love and we do out of passion. So saying that we want to know what are the other resources that would be available for our people technical assistance. Right now we are working in King County. We have about, between us living well can, about eight acres of land that we are growing. We have had a horrible year. We could not put in our seed in because of the weather. It was all flooded. We've had, we need technical assistance. We don't have our own tractors. We don't have our own, we need people to pay people to do the work. But people, it's important to understand the mind of the immigrant because we work extra hard because we don't only support ourselves, we support people back in our home countries. And it becomes very challenging when I have to go from job to job in order to be able to put food on my own table and my kids. So just requesting that this information about uh, technical assistance, land acquisition, almost impossible for us. There's so many red tips. We've been trying to find land for the last six years. We haven't. We can only get a lease. 
probably year to year or a five year list to grow. So how do we empower such small organizations like ours, like what Mas is doing, into having that space at the table? I know some of these grant reviews are very skewed towards bigger organizations, so that when somebody like Marcy or myself applies, we are we have not in business for long enough, so you don't qualify, which is like almost 20 points. So there is a lot of systemic things that are still there that need to be ironed out. And I wrote a letter to the WSDA saying that, that it is important that we have these conversations. We've been included in those people that are making these decisions and even the people who are receiving this funding. Because honestly speaking, we do a lot of work and we really acknowledge that we want that connection to the ground. And most importantly, I want to thank NABC for all the good work that you've done in making sure we have these conversations because it's a good place to start. I know I can speak for three days about the challenges that we face, but I really appreciate that we've been offered this opportunity just to come and listen to Mercy talk about have lunch. I know I didn't have any food to eat and we're supposed to be eating lunch, but I'm just kidding. But I just <laughs> want to thank you, NABC, very much for the opportunity for us to be in this moment. Thank you. David, thank you so much for reinforcing that statement. This is exactly why um, some of you may not know why we conducted this study, but really because I was working with Wazoo on the staple crop. And when this study came out, uh, my colleague and I are like, Wait a minute. Very little money was given to us to do the study, to be sincere because it's public money. Only 35, 40,000 was allocated. I think it was 35. Was we ended up spending more money on us because I spent hours and hours, over hours and hours, weeks and weeks. Um, you can see that report is professionally designed. Um, they gave UW 100,000. But we said, we got 40,000, we got to make it work. We got to make it last. So my partner and I, who we work on the Wasu food system on the staple crop, we decided to literally ask Wazu direct food system director to allow us to put together. I begged, can I put a BIPOC team to do this one? Because if it's about BIPOC, then BIPOC should be conducting the study. Wazu food system didn't feel comfortable enough doing that with me and I say, I, I'm just one person. I need to get people around. So I put out a word out and I say, there is an opportunity here for us to make a difference. Who is in? It was a huge struggle to put the team together, but we finally got a team of aggregators, some of them who are doing hunger relief. And that's what got me into this work. That's what got me into the hunger relief. And what David, you're saying, those are all the things that any BIPOC can speak to servers. Being rejected, I, as we speak, this very minute, me and my partners, including the host of this program, we got denied by was the based on cost of food. Because people who have been manipulating the system for a long time know how. People who do this work, like David said, with real heart, know that there's no way at any single time in America not even in my country, that you can put food with when you charge 45 cents a pound. The equations that they use, the people who know how, how the system works keep getting back in again and again. We got booted out. Out of the hunger lady that I worked really hard to get into because I charge you dollars for the work that I have to do. I have people right now that I'm having a meeting on Saturday to tell them, I'm sorry, I can't continue employing you. I, I was hoping to continue giving people employment to do hunger relief, package the food, stock take, make sure it's healthy, sort it out, go harvest from the farm and bring it up so we can pack it fresh. Buy food from, from black and brown farmers so they can, people like David, can continue to create equity. If we, if we get the money, we buy it from the, from the black and brown farmers. All that effort because of the funding systems, because of the equations that are put in place to put the same people back on the plate, curtailed all our dreams to create equity according to the government. But according to Haki and to all of those who are here who believe in equity, 
like David, Akedo, all those who here who believe that we can make equity happen, we won't stop because of funding. But what we can stop is pushing the government to change their methodologies of assigning, allocating funding. $53 million right now is headed to the pockets of the people who cannot go where I have been able to go, who cannot have a conversation with the people I've had a conversation with, who leave, when I leave a pop-up, I leave in tears because I mean what I do. I'm not about saving grades. I'm not about ticking a box. Anybody who is doing social justice with a real heart is because they see the real stuff. I've seen people say, I get a mushroom. I say, of course you get a mushroom because it's healthy for you. Other people eat it. You mean I get rhubarb? Yes, you get rhubarb in your basket. You get ginger, you get turmeric. And you get lemon and oranges and mangoes, things you have, cannot afford in the store. Try buying a mango. Try buying an avocado, ginger. You get those. That's what being cultural elephant means. We go to individual communities. We say, who are you serving today, this weekend? Latinx. What do they eat again? How expensive are these things? We go looking for them. We shop based on who we are serving. That's not something that anyone who don't understand being Black, being Latinx, being Asian, being a Native person, what it is. I can never in my lifetime pretend to be an American. I can never at any time take the position of my husband and say, hey, I'm gonna be you. Never can I do that because how he was brought up made who he was. I was brought up, made me who I am. So you cannot replace us in the system. You have to include us in the system. So we can make the change together. And I like what David said, technical support, resource sharing is critical. Uh, Mercy, so Daniel had asked a question in the chat. That's a, a great question. And I think we should definitely answer after as well with some links to resources, but it was, are any, the particular, and I actually, you did just kind of answer it, any particular types of support that other orgs in this meeting could, pro, meeting could provide for hockey farmers to continue advancing your important work? Um, and that question was in there. And I also wanted to acknowledge that Laura, it looks like Laura and David both have hands raised. And if you want, if we don't, cause be mindful of time, it is one o'clock. If you wanna pop your questions into the chat, um, if we don't get a chance to discuss them here today, I will make sure that Mercy gets them and we'll send out a Q&A sheet so everyone gets, gets an answer to their question. Thank you, David, for asking that question. Um, like many nonprofit, David said, um, we work for nothing we, because we are committed to the mission. We see what the communities are suffering from. We also know that land is, important, we've been, like David, we've been looking for land for a while. We've been lucky in the South Sound, we've been lucky for people who come, at, come up and say, use my land. That's, we are right now, as I speak, my husband and my daughter are out at Little Rock, teething about three and a half acres of donated land that we're gonna grow food, sorghum, cultural elephant food. Um, we are now sitting here with about 500 communities of color waiting for food next week. We have promised to show back up there. We're gonna go back. We don't know how because the funding that we were given was not even enough. People got have a million, a million. We got a hundred thousand. We made it work. We gave people food double what we could give them. So we are trying to scramble, trying to continue our hunger relief. So our plan is to launch a hunger relief program and ask community to support us to put continue putting food on the table for these people show, showing up at their communities in Mason County, Lewis County, um, and showing up for the immigrant communities in the King County South, showing up for the black community in Central District who look forward to seeing us with, with fresh food. If you don't know about Central District, it used to be a black neighborhood. 
gentrification has pushed those people. There's still a few seniors who live there. So when we show up with food, some people can pick up the food and go cook for the seniors who are still living in Central District. King County South, SeaTac, um, Taquira, Lenton has a lot of uh, immigrant community because they've been pushed and black people, they've been pushed by gentrification in Seattle to the outskirts of the, of the city. So we go out there and team up with communities like um, where um, the communities that are working with this immigrant community to make sure that we can continue providing access and using government dollars to do this because there is money from the government to do this work. But we have to use mutual aid to do it. So we are asking the government to not hold us back, allow us to do this because we can grow food, we can organize, we can deliver. We do do deliveries. Um, so if you wanna help us and spread the word, I'm putting our donate link there, but I'm also putting our website because in the next couple months here, actually weeks, not months, sorry, we are going to be launching our hunger relief and we could really use help um, in supporting that. So we don't have to go back and tell families who expect us in July and August that we are not coming. I'm sitting on an email right now, not knowing how to set that email. So I've been making personal calls to the sites um, discussing with them how we can collaborate to continue moving the food to the communities who have showed up. We go to Mason County and a community that never has ever come out. And this one group has been trying to connect with them for a long time. They speak no English at all. And I don't wanna say who they are, but we managed to bring them to come for food. The biggest heartbreaking for me is trying to say that I'm not gonna show up the next two weeks with food. So if you would like to support our mission for hunger relief, right now you can donate on our PayPal, you can send us checks, you can send us food donation. If you have food that you're growing and you want to, we'll come pick it up. We'll come get the food from you. We will pick it up. Our goal was to buy food from local farmers, but of course we don't have money. So we'll take donations instead because we have to keep this one going. Um, I had David say that they don't have tractors. We managed to buy a tractor. So BIPOC farmers who don't have tractors, because that's another thing. We, we couldn't find a tractor to till the land. So we are now scrambling, tilling the land so we can put sorghum. Uh, so we have a tractor. We hope to continue buying uh, equipment that can be shared by BIPOC who don't have resources. So if you would like to support our equipment fund, we have a list of things on our Instagram, our website that you can help us. We share, we share resources with our black and brown farmers um, and we share seeds, we share studs, we buy studs and take them to buy park. So there's many ways your funds can be used, not just for paying salaries, but really every dollar goes back into the community for now. Mercy, thank you. Um, your passion for the work that you do and the love, your love for the uh, people you serve is truly inspiring. Um, I wanna thank you for taking the time to, to present today, to present your uh, report and, and your experience. Um, and uh, I'll remind people, you know, that, that idea of land access came up and, and the next Lunch and Learn is about land access. So if you have an opportunity, um, Mercy and David, if you're still listening, um, you know, please consider joining us for that. Thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having lunch with us and thanks again, Mercy. Thank you so much, Mike, for providing this opportunity for con con this conversation. I think um, it's an intimidating conversation for a lot of uh, our allies. But I really thank you for the boldness that you've taken, um, you know, trying to really figure out how can NABC do better. Uh, these are some of the questions that I like to see people exploring when it comes to equity, not just putting a rubber stamp, you're doing equity, but really trying to engage the people that are actually doing the work and finding resources for them. And I, I want to thank you for allowing that opportunity. I promise not to be emotional because I'm an activist and this work can really weigh heavy. I eat, drink, sleep on equity. 
<laughs> but today I'm opting not to be emotional about it because I know that my strength and my energies have to go into finding ways to keep Haki and our partners uh, work moving. Dora with not with, with Dora without Dora, we have to continue these conversations and we have to find ways to put money into black and brown communities. So thank you everybody who came out today to listen to me. Follow Haki on Facebook, Instagram, Facebook, um, website, or oh, ask Mike where to find me. <laughs> and my DNA really know where to find me. I'm a member of the Southwest Food Hub. So we are always, I think that group is always looking for people to come tell us what they're doing in their community. So reach out to me and I'll send you to the people who help the Southwest Food Hub bring speakers to tell us what they're doing in their community so we can find more collaborators. Thank you. That was a great lunch. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Mercy. That was great. Thank you, Emily, for facilitating. And I don't know, Mercy, if I've told you, but we, for one of our pilot project committees where we're creating um, sort of like a technical assistance fund, I've been using your document on kind of grant panel and rubric grading, and it has been so helpful. It helped us identify like some problem areas and just punch it up and make it so much better. So that I'm going to make sure to share that with the group too, because I think that for us, that's been super helpful. Yeah, yeah, we, we find um, those tools that people ignore when they're doing project management are very, very important in creating equities, equitable systems. We have to apply the same way when we go to the deep community.